Chapter 15 of Elusive Isabel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Elusive Isabel by Jacques Futrelle. Chapter 15 Master of the Situation. As the women rose and started out, leaving the gentlemen over their coffee and cigars, Miss Thorne paused at the door, and the blue-gray eyes flashed some subtle message to the French ambassador, who, after an instant, nodded comprehendingly, then resumed his conversation. As he left the room a few minutes later, he noticed that Mr. Grimm had joined a group of automaniacs, of which Mr. Cadwallader was the enthusiastic center. He spoke to his hostess, the wife of the minister from Portugal, for a moment, then went to Miss Thorne and dropped into a seat beside her. She greeted him with a smile, and was still smiling as she talked. "'I believe, monsieur,' she said in French, "'you sent a code message to the cable office this afternoon.' His eyes questioned hers quickly. "'And please bear in mind that we probably are being watched as we talk she went on pleasantly. Mr. Grimm is the man to be afraid of. Smile, don't look so serious, she laughed outright. Yes, I sent a code message, he replied. It was your resignation? Yes. Well, it wasn't sent, of course, she informed him, and her eyes were sparkling as if something amusing had been said. One of my agents stopped it. I may add that it will not be sent. The ambassador's eyes grew steely, then blank again. Mademoiselle, what am I to understand from that? he demanded. You are to understand that I am absolute master of the situation in Washington at this moment, she replied positively. The smile on her lips and the tone of her voice were strangely at variance. From the beginning, I let you understand that ultimately you would receive your instructions from Paris. Now I know they will reach you by cable tomorrow. Within a week, the compact will be signed. Whether you approve of it or not, it will be signed for your country by a special envoy whose authority is greater than yours. His Highness, the Prince Benedetto de Brucci. Has he reached Washington? He is in Washington. He has been here for some time, incognito. She was silent a moment. You have been a source of danger to our plans, she added. If it had not been for an accident, you would still have been comfortably kept out in Alexandria, where Mr. Grimm and I found you. Please remember, monsieur, that we will accomplish what we set out to do. Nothing can stop us. Nothing. At just about the same moment, the name of Prince de Brucci had been used in the dining room, but in a different connection. Mr. Cadwallader was reciting some incident of an automobile trip in Italy when he had been connected with the British Embassy there. The prince was driving, he said, and one of the best I ever saw. Corking chap, the prince, democratic, you know, and all that sort of thing. He was one scion of royalty who didn't mind soiling his hands by diving in under a car and fixing it himself. At that time he was inclined to be wild. That was eight or nine years ago. But they say now he has settled down to work and is one of the real diplomatic powers of Italy. I haven't seen him for half a dozen years. How old a man is he? asked Mr. Grimm carelessly. Thirty-five, thirty-eight, perhaps, I don't know, replied Mr. Cadwallader. It's odd, you know, the number of princes and blue bloods and all that sort of thing one can find knocking about in Italy and Germany and Spain. One never hears of half of them. I never had heard of Prince de Brucci until I went to Italy, and I've heard jolly well little of him since, except indirectly. Mr. Cadwallader lapsed into silence as he sat staring at a large group photograph which was framed on a wall of the dining room. 
"'Isn't that the royal family of Italy?' he asked. He rose and went over to it. "'By Jove it is, and here is the prince in the group. The picture was taken, I should say, about the time I knew him.' Mr. Grimm strolled over idly and stood for a long time, staring at the photograph. "'He can drive a motor, you know,' said Mr. Cadwallader admiringly. "'And Italy is the place to drive them. "'They forgot to make any speed laws over there, "'and if a chap gets in your way and you knock him silly, "'they arrest him for obstructing traffic, you know. "'Over here, if a chap really starts to go any place in a hurry, "'some bally idiot holds him up.' "'Have you ever been held up?' queried Mr. Grimm. "'No, but I expect to be every day,' was the reply. "'I've got a new motor, you know, and I've never been able to see how fast it is. "'The other evening I ran up to Baltimore with it in an hour and thirty-seven minutes "'from Alexandria to Druid Hill Park, and that's better than forty miles. "'I never did let the motor out, you know, because we ran in the dark most of the way.' "'Mr. Grimm was still gazing at the photograph. "'Did you go alone?' he asked. "'There's no fun motoring alone, you know. "'Senorita Rodriguez was with me. "'Charming girl, what?' "'A little while later, Mr. Grimm sauntered out into the drawing-room "'and made his way towards Miss Thorne and the French ambassador. "'Monsieur Boisségur rose and offered his hand cordially. "'I hope, monsieur,' said Mr. Grimm, that you are no worse off for your for your unpleasant experience not at all thanks to you was the reply i have just thanked miss thorne for her part in the affair and i'm glad to have been of service interrupted mr grimm lightly the ambassador bowed ceremoniously and moved away mr grimm dropped into the seat he had just left you've left the legation haven't you he asked. "'You drove me out,' she laughed. "'Drove you out,' he repeated. "'Drove you out?' "'Why, it was not only uncomfortable, but it was rather conspicuous, because of the constant espionage of your Mr. Blair and your Mr. Johnson and your Mr. Hastings,' she explained, still laughing. "'So I have moved to the Hotel Hilliard.' Mr. Grimm was twisting the seal ring on his little finger. "'I'm sorry if I've made it uncomfortable for you,' he apologized. "'You see, it's necessary to—' "'No explanation,' Miss Thorne interrupted. "'I understand.' "'I'm glad you do,' he replied seriously. "'How long do you intend to remain in the city?' "'Really, I don't know. Two, three. Four weeks, perhaps? Why? I was just wondering. Senorita Rodriguez came toward them. We're going to play bridge, she said, and we need you, Isabel, to make the four. Come. I hate to take her away, Mr. Grimm. Mr. Grimm and Miss Thorne rose together. For an instant her slim white hand rested on Mr. Grimm's sleeve, and she stared into his eyes understandingly with a little of melancholy in her own. They left Mr. Grimm there. End of chapter 15 Recording by Roger Moline